So when it rains in Gainesville, you often experience a very unique smell known as petrichor. Okay, so I'm sure, I'm sure you guys all know what I'm talking about. And petrichor arises from this molecule known as geosmin. Geosmin, okay, so that's what's shown over here. Okay, so for part A, it says draw the starting material of geosmin that would be used to synthesize the alcohol functional group under acid catalyzed hydration conditions. Okay, so let me back up. So as of today, we haven't talked about other reactions that have been able to form alcohols, but we will by the end of today. Uh, however, I also gave you a huge hint because I said that we're going to use acid catalyzed hydration conditions. So that's you know, a big hint already. And that tells me that I can already imagine what my main reagent is going to be. So under acid catalyzed hydration conditions in the chat box, please tell me my two main reagents I need. We have crickets, <laughs> water and acid catalyst, water, yep. And water and acid, water and acid, I love that. You guys got it. Okay, so Hal, not HX and water. Um, just double check that one, that would be halo hydrant. Uh, acid and water, acid and water, yep, love that. So we're thinking already water and acid, okay? Well, what is this whole chapter about? This whole chapter, at least chapter six, has been alkenes, okay? And you know we haven't talked more than alkenes yet. So um, we're probably going to deal with the starting material that is an alkene and then subjecting it to water and acid. Okay, so now look at the placement of the, al I mean, of the alcohol on this, uh, on this uh, molecule, geo geosmin. And we see that we have an alcohol at this kind of tertiary position. Okay, and we know we have to follow Markovnikov's rule. So I have to think about places that I can put this pi bond maybe here, okay, or here, or here, that will give me the... Um, a di give me addition where the alcohol is on that more and more most substitute position. Okay, so the way that I can do that is I can draw a structure that maybe looks like this. Okay, and I'm subjecting that to maybe water and acid. Okay, so do we see how that's my starting material? So this is going backwards, and it's important to know that this is the material, the starting material, because if I were to now subject this to water and acid, we would get a carbocation, not at the secondary position, but at the tertiary position. And that's sufficient enough for, an for that water group to come in and synthesize an alcohol at the tertiary position. It's not gonna be at this position because if I put the alkene here, it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting half of your alcohol here and then the other half here because they would both be tertiary. So what I'm saying is it's not gonna be something like this. You can't put your alcohol here and excuse me, you can't put your alkene there because this is a tertiary center. This is also a tertiary center. So we would actually get two different products, okay? We wouldn't just get geosmin. We would get geosmin and then something else, another structural isomer of that, okay? So it can't be that one. And then likewise, it, it can't be up here because if it was up here, we would exceed the octet with 10 bonds at that carbon, okay? So it should all make sense, you know? So this is definitely the answer to A, this, this starting alkene and this region over there these reagents. Any questions about how I went backwards? Because I'm going to guarantee you you're going to have backwards questions on your test. That's why we're doing this right now. Okay, cool. So from the structure you drew in part A, draw potential minor products and include all major stereoisomers. Okay, so if we clearly have addition for the alcohol on this, you know, more substitute position, which follows Markovnikov's rule, the only possibility to get minor products would be if that carbocation formed at the less substituted or secondary position. So I'm gonna draw the main intermediate down here. So you know, we're thinking we had this main you know, um, starting material, okay? But now my you know, intermediate is gonna be not at the tertiary position, but a carbocation at my secondary position. So I'm thinking there instead of here. Okay, and then that gives me an alcohol, and remember that's sp2, and we have that unhybridized p orbital. So we can attack from the front face or the back face of that center, and we're left with you know two major diastereomers. Okay, so we get you know the alcohol maybe on a wedge at that position, and then we could also potentially get the alcohol on a dash. Okay, so this would be my answer to part B. Those would be two potential minor products of geosmin. Okay, any questions on that? Awesome. Okay, so for C, are rearrangements possible? Okay, and, and either of these structures, are rearrangements possible? Okay, so let's look here. 
And if the carbocation were tertiary, I'm asking myself, are there rearrangements? And here with the secondary carbocation, are there rearrangements? What's the answer to that? Um, actually, I should probably make this question a little bit more specific. Are there rearrangements possible with our starting structure? Okay, with the tertiary carbocation. That's, that's the question I'm asking you. Okay, yes or no in the chat box. Are rearrangements possible with this carbocation that's formed on the tertiary position? Nope, nope, awesome. You guys got it. And no, because we're already at the tertiary position, okay? So that would, you know, we, we can't go to the right because that would just be another tertiary position. If we went to the left, it would be secondary. And if we went up, well, there's nothing to shift, so you can't even go up, okay? There's no hydride to move. So essentially, we are, we are kind of stuck at that tertiary position. So the answer for C is no. Okay. So D, uh, draw the transition state, which we haven't done yet um, or shown in any session. Draw the transition state where the water approaches the key electrophilic reagent based on the reaction scheme you drew in part A. Okay. So let's think about that. So the reaction scheme for part A is up here. Okay. We knew the key electrophilic reagent had to have been that tertiary carbocation, okay? Remember the carbocation here, that's the one we're talking about. So I'm gonna reproduce that below. So that would be something that looks like, oh, this pen is dying on me. Um, it would be something that looks like this, okay? And we wanna draw the transition state where water approaches that key electrophilic reagent. Okay, so what a transition state is, is it's going to be a structure, okay? It's a theoretical structure, it doesn't actually exist. And it's something that kind of reflects all the bonds and that are forming and breaking, you know, in, in a given structure. So what we know is, is that um, I have to actually, so that's the main re, re, um, key intermediate, excuse me. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw that, you know, just, sorry, let me reproduce this over here. So let me get my pen. So what we're showing is water is going to form a bond with one of its lone pairs to this, you know, carbocation. So what you would draw is that's a dashed line, okay? And see how I drew that dashed line? What that dashed line indicates is like a bond is in the process of forming. It's not a complete bond because that would be a, a full solid line. What it's saying with these dashes is it's like, oh, we're, we're kind of starting to form a bond as the water approaches you know, this carbocation. And this isn't the end structure. What you actually have to draw are brackets around these, okay, brackets. And you draw what we, it looks like an equal sign and then a line through it. So we call this the dagger, okay? This is the dagger, okay? And that's the answer for part D. This is the transition state. And we'll go over that a little bit more today. We haven't been able to, to go through that. The Christmas tree, I like that. Yeah, that's cool. Or if you turn your head sideways, it looks like a fence. I don't know. Okay. So that's pretty much it for this question. So definitely um, a critical thinking question, um, a little bit more complicated than what we're used to, but I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibilities for you to answer. Okay, so we are going to, I think I have some questions in here real quick. How um, would you rearrange if the new position gave it resonance? Good question. The new position gave it resonance. Yeah, you could do that. Um, if the new position does give you resonance, but that new position is still more stable, meaning like, let's think like, if we're shifting from a primary position to a tertiary with resonance, 100%. Um, if we're going from a primary to maybe a secondary with, uh, with resonance, or something like that, you would have to know your HIAs a little bit more just to make sure that that transition is sufficient in terms of um, 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 rearranging, that the, that the driving force is there. Okay, so we're gonna jump into reaction practice. And um, we left off on uh, halohydrin synthesis so I am going to just do a couple more examples of that, and then we're going to do the rest of chapter six, and then briefly introduce chapter seven, because we have to do all of chapter seven on Wednesday. Okay, so we are at this structure. So we are on page 65 of the student workbook, and I'm on 11V with you guys. Okay, so what we have is this aldehyde with a, you know, um, a, a tri-substituted alkene. And we're subjecting it to hydrobar, excuse me, not hydroboration. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're subjecting it to halohydrin um, conditions. Okay, so remember what we've talked about with the halohydrin. Halohydrins are basically structures, it's a functional group where the 
halogen and the hydrate are one carbon removed. So we'll get a halogen somewhere and we'll get a hydrogen somewhere else and we'll put those together and that's a halohydrin. Okay, so what do I do? Well, we said that this was a concerted, oh, oh for me it's Br2, my bad, so it must be Cl2, doesn't matter, but Cl2. And essentially this is going to be a concerted mechanism just like we saw with the bromination or chlorination reactions. And remember what it is, is we have chlorine over here, diatomic chlorine, this is page 65, Emily. Um, 65 letter D. Okay, so what's happening is, is we're going to have a concerted mechanism where our nucleophilic pi bond is going to grab, you know, maybe this chlorine that causes this chlorine to come off as chloride because, you know, we exceed the octet at that position. And remember what we said the consequence was is that when we pull these pi electrons away from this sigma bonding framework, we kind of get this partial positive developing on the other carbon of the alkene. So it makes sense that any, give, any other of those lone pairs is gonna come back and form this halonium bridge. Okay, so what was the key thing for drawing these structures? And I said, you wanna take this flat depiction, rotate it 90 degrees like that, okay? And then draw that bridge coming on a wedge or a dash. So for me, I mean, uh, from the top or the bottom, I should say, excuse me. So for me, I'm thinking something like, Okay, the halonium bridge forming up top. And then also that halonium bridge could have formed below. So same stereochem in terms of aldehyde. And then I know there's no stereochemistry with the methyls, but I'm just drawing them for wedges and dashes just because we're consistent with the, with the orientation that I showed it. Okay, so that's kind of the first step. So we have this halonium bridged intermediates. And then we have water, our second reagent, and now we have a competition. So like I said, and I try to prove this to you guys, water versus chloride, which, you know, in terms of which, which molecular species or atomic species, I should say, for the chloride, is going to be more nucleophilic or more capable of donating its electrons into that, you know, in these reactive centers, okay? Water, and it's water, yeah, exactly. And we kind of use this rationale in terms of electronegativity because chloride is this, you know, super, super electronegative halogen, so it wants to keep electrons, keep electrons, and water, yeah, the oxygen's a little electronegative, but it's not definitely not anywhere near as electronegative on the pollen scale as this chloride anion's gonna be. So I'll just say less, um, less electronegative. Okay, so since it's less than electronegative, it's more capable of donating. So water is gonna be my main reagent. And we kind of talked about last class, why we're going to be regioselective in the sense that we're going to react at one specific position of these bridges. And we kind of used resonance structures to rationalize where that logic came from. And, and the reason is, is when we see these resonance structures, we get a tertiary carbocation at this position and we would get a secondary carbocation at that position. So since the tertiary carbocation is more stable here, it makes sense that water is going to attack here and that forces us to break this chloride carbon bond because we exceed the octet, and then we get anti-addition, okay? So what we have essentially is a structure from up there that looks like this, okay? We get, um, and I'm just gonna draw the two methyl groups there, okay? And then remember that final step is we assume we have excess reagent and we can deprotonate you know, that final proton synthesizing our halohydrin. And we proved how this was anti-addition anti by drawing a Newman projection. And we drew the Newman, we don't have to do that again, but we drew a Newman projection down this bond axis. And we, res and we saw with respect to the chloride and the uh, hydroxyl group that they are 180 degrees or anti from another, okay? So this is one structure. And then you can do the same thing over here with this other main intermediate above. And we could say it's going to attack here and it's gonna cause that to break. So I'm gonna reproduce that below. So that's gonna be something that looks like, and this is the final product. And this one be that. Okay. So we get, you know, this main structure, oops, excuse me, this main structure and this main structure, these two, I'm sorry. Okay. So, and if you're wondering how those would be related, pancake flip this one over, pancake flip the left structure over, and you see that that becomes a wedge. So if this is a wedge and that's a dash, these two are nanotimers. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. 
both pages is done. We're good. Abby, we're good. Oh, you're just saying water. So this is basically the same as the halogenation we went over last Wednesday. But yes, exactly. Awesome, Lauren. That's exactly it. And Abby, got it. Lauren, not me actually understanding. No, you got it. You definitely understand it. And uh, can I draw it? Yes. So that was one way. Some people don't like it. I prefer this way to draw it like this. People don't always do that, but that's okay. So what you could have also done is take this starting material, okay? Keep the sigma bond framework in plane, okay? So that's something like this. And what you can draw is either that, you can draw this, you know, chlorine bridge forming on a wedge, okay? And um, that, or you could draw the chlorine bridge coming on a dash, okay? Actually, it's probably better just to have a line here because it's a chiral on the right, but you know what I mean. Okay, so either the wedge or the dash, and we know that water would attack basically that side. It would attack the, from the back face because the wedge face is already sterically hindered. So the resulting structure would be something like, uh, this is a chiral at this position. So I really shouldn't draw the dash hydroxyl, but I'm just showing in terms of how I got the anti-addition. And then same thing for over here, water would attack that position and break the bridge. So we would get a structure that looks like this. Um, yeah, so it'd be more accurate to like, you know, not have chirality at the hydroxyl position because there are two methyl groups, but this would be equivalent to those two structures. I don't know, but yeah. Um, not necessarily true. I mean, like it's possible. Um, but either or, you could, you could also have answer choices that look like this. So be prepared to do both routes because if you guys aren't comfortable with the rotations, this might trip you up because this is actually a valid structure. Um, okay, up to you guys. Um, all right, so I think that's good for Halo O'Brien. Let's see, uh, I'm having trouble understanding when we know which goes on wedges and dashes. For the bridges, so I'm really just saying there's 50-50, there's both. So in this situation, I just basically said 50% of my starting material is gonna convert to the wedged bridge, and the other 50% is gonna be the dashed bridge. Um, but I know that if, if I decided to use this wedged bridge, water has to come from the back face. And our argument for that was sterics, because the wedge says that, oh, the front face has too many electrons nearby and it's repulsive, and I don't wanna come from the front. So what I have to do is I come from the back face, okay, that's right here, that's the dashed hydroxyl, and that forces this wedged chlorine originally to swivel over and still stay as a wedge, okay? It doesn't matter that it's down now. We're not flipping or rotating anything. It's just, we're drawing it like in this novel depiction just so that it helps you. This isn't really how it is in real life, but what happens is whatever the stereochem was for the chlorine in the original bridge is gonna be what the chlorine is in the end product as well, okay? And, um, Okay, hope that helps. All right, so that's, I think, good for halo hydrogen. We have a lot more reactions to practice. So let's keep going in there. So I think that's reaction five at this point. So now we're halfway done with this chapter. So reaction six is oxymercuration, demercuration. Oh, and guys, we have a little visitor. We have a little visitor. This is my cat, Wiki. He is gonna climb on the, on the little things. He's actually almost seven months. He was found on the Gainesville Airport tarmac. I think I told you guys that. He's so cute and soft. Um, yeah, he's a rescue. Okay, some happiness in your orgo class today. Airport king. <laughs> all right, we're gonna go back. All right, except he has to stop walking all of you guys. Okay, so oxymercuration is an interesting reaction and it has to do with um, synthesizing an alcohol, but we're actually not gonna have a carbocation intermediate this time. So there's a very key consequence for um, the potential rearrangements in Markovnikov's rule. I think you can kind of allude to that, or that's gone before we're done with that. So this is a very weird reaction, and honestly, you're probably never going to use it again after this class, and I mean after uh, this exam, and I'll explain why in a second. So let's just do a simple example. Let me do, you know, the, the characteristic vinyl, you know, example. I always kind of just show you guys this. Okay, so this is the first reaction where we have two distinct steps. So before, you know, where we had, you know, something like this, we had water and maybe acid. And we, sh we said, my, my logic to you guys was like, okay, for all intents and purposes, if there's no numbers here, you're gonna have a beaker. I hope you guys remember that. And I'm gonna throw water 
and I'm gonna throw acid in there, do as you oughta, add acid to water. I hope you guys remember that. And um, essentially, you could assume that those two um, reagents were gonna mix together and that key intermediate, or that key reagent, excuse me, hydronium was synthesized. Here, that's not happening. What we have is, in reaction in line one, we're subjecting it to specifically this, this thing called mercuric acetate, okay? So this weird structure. So some sort of you know, solvent, THF, which we'll talk about in a second, and water. So what's happening is, is at first, we're taking this alkene and subjecting it to all three of those in a flask, okay? Then forming some product. Then getting rid of everything from step one and throwing that product into everything from step two, okay? And that's just one thing, okay? So sodium borohydride, okay? So pretty much that is my main reaction scheme. So I know the reagents look weird, okay? But every single one of these is gonna make sense by the end of my discussion with you guys. So it won't be memorization. You guys will understand why everything's there, okay? So our key, in, our key reagent here, okay? This is, let me just write oxymercuration. So oxymercuration, okay? Demercuration. And that name is gonna make a lot of sense in a second, okay? So oxymercuration, so we're adding this oxymercury group, okay? And then demercuration, so we think removing that mercury group, okay? So you can kind of imagine what this reaction is going to progress through, okay? So essentially what's gonna happen is, let's just draw the structure of mercuric acetate, which is this, H-G-O-A-C, O-A-C. Okay, so that's really all you need to know is this mercury with two, and AC is just acetyl group, so these are basically two esters. So for all intents and purposes, what it is is, it's that, um, if you guys care. Okay, so that's really the structure, but you don't need to ever draw this. Okay, keep it as that, okay, mercuric acetate. And this is another one of those cyclic um, concerted mechanisms, okay, where we're going to have three arrows in our, you know, first step. So I know that this nucleophilic pi bond is going to, you know, maybe grab a mercury, okay, causing this acetate to break, and then, you know, we can come back and form that bridge, okay? Excuse me. So this is going to be something, a new intermediate that we haven't had, so it's not the holonium bridged intermediate anymore. What this is, is it's going to be this cyclic mercuric acetate intermediate. Okay, so we're going to draw that right here. So the cyclic I know these names are really crazy. Cyclic mercuric acetate intermediate. Okay. Um, kind of confused on the difference. Let me see the rest of the question between when you get an ether or an alcohol with these. Um, we'll prove it in a second when I finish the reaction. Okay. So um, essentially, we have this cyclic mercuric acetate intermediate. And what that looks like, again, remember, I'm just taking this vinyl group flat and rotating it 90 degrees like that. So essentially, I think that all makes sense to you guys. And then the, that's one intermediate. And the other one, okay, so those are my two main intermediates, okay? So to be kind of rationalized, these are the exact same things that we just saw with halogenation and halohydrin synthesis. In terms of the concerted mechanism, we get this bridge. However, you know, you get this extra OAC group coming along, okay? So that's just something a little bit different, okay? And then the same logic is gonna happen with, I think we can kind of predict water, okay? So what is THF? So THF is a solvent. I actually use that a lot. You guys will probably come across it maybe once or twice in, in the organic lab next semester, but THF is tetrahydrofuran. And I don't know if you guys remember this example. I think I gave you guys this, I gave you guys furin. Um, and we got, when we were doing like orbitals, and I was like, what's the bond orbitals for furin? Like, you know, I was like, that's a solvent. Well, another solvent is the tetrahydrofurin version. So tetrahydrofurin, where does that come from? Well, this is furin. So tetrahydro, one, two, three, four. We added four hydrogens to get to tetrahydroforin. Okay, does that make sense? You added four hydrogens to get from that structure to that structure. Cool. I don't know. So THF, again, is an inert solvent. So for all intents and purposes, you can cross it out and ignore it. Okay, so it's another one of those like DCMs or, or chloroforms that we're seeing. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, ignore THF. Okay, just proving furin to tetrahydrofurin. Kind of helps. I don't know. 
Anyway, so then the next step uh, from step one, at least, is, is this water molecule. So the exact same chemical logic that we saw before is going to happen here. So water is going to come in, attack the more substituted positions for reasons we've already discussed, and then we're going to break that bridge because we exceed the octet. So essentially, we get, again, anti-addition, and I'm skipping that deprotonation step. I think you guys can see how this final water proton gets removed. Again, we assume excess reagent, the water will come in. We've seen that a million times already. So with respect to you know, the mercuric acetate substituent, we see anti-addition with that water, okay? And then again, same thing can happen over here and break that open. So another example of this would be here, that and HGOAC. So over here are my two main products from step one. Okay, I know this is kind of all over the place, but let's kind of like digest this all again, okay? So this is the first time where we have two distinct steps. Okay, so step one, this reaction line, is the oxymercuration step. So this is the time that where you're going to add an oxymercury group, okay? So we, we found out what this oxymercury group is. It followed the exact same concerted mechanism that, you know, halogenation has seen, how halohydrin synthesis has seen. And we get these bridged intermediates again, okay? We know that THF is inert, so ignore it. But water, again, is that same reactive nucleophile that's going to attack at the more substituted positions for reasons we've talked about, okay? So we get anti-addition and with these water and, you know, mercuric acetate substituents, okay? That's the, from the cyclic mercuric acetate intermediate to the main products from step one. This isn't the products of the reaction, okay? So then after that, what we're gonna do is subject it to this reagent called sodium borohydride. And down here, I'll draw that. So sodium borohydride is just a structure that looks like that, okay? And for all intents and purposes, you'll, you'll touch on the mechanism in Orgo 2. Right now, you do not need to know the mechanism for sodium borohydride. It will come up in Orgo 2, but not now. So for all intents and purposes, for your logic, for understanding, this is a source of hydrogen. You can see all of these hydrogens. What we're gonna do is do the demercuration step, okay? So demercuration means remove this, okay? Well, if I'm gonna remove this, what am I gonna replace it with? One of these hydrogens. You kind of follow that logic? So we're not gonna show a mechanism. You're, you don't need to know it, it's not even covered. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna take all the structures that you have from step one, and you can just replace the hydrogen. That's the demercuration step. So that's that one. And pretty simple, okay, and hydrogen, okay? So I don't need to really draw these hydrogens, okay? But you can see that we have these alcohols, okay? And I can, you know, re-rotate this, you know, rotate these around, and essentially you get a water here, and then water here. It doesn't matter about the chirality because you have two methyl groups anyway, but essentially you get those final two products. And you, you even saw, you could have drawn those two and that's also fine. Okay, so let's kind of go back to that starting material and talk about what we formed. So look at this reaction, okay? If I were to subject it maybe to a different reaction, so water, let's say HCl, okay? What's my product? Something like that, right? Okay, well, isn't that the exact same thing we just got down here? So basically, this whole crazy reaction, and the reason why I said you probably will never touch it again, is because, yes, this does form alcohols. Yes, this is the exact same reaction that we saw in terms of forming that alcohol with the first reaction, the acid-catalyzed hydration. But the difference here is we never went through, we never went through anywhere in this mechanism, a carbocation. So the key here is that there is no rearrangements possible Whereas under these reaction conditions, there are rearrangements possible. So that is a huge thing. Everybody write that down because I'm sure you're going to get tested on this. Oxymercuration, demercuration forms the exact same thing as acid catalyzed hydration. I just proved that to you. However, with oxymercuration, demercuration, there was no carbocations. So that means no rearrangements. Okay, so we're going to build. Okay, so essentially, let's take this structure. And I think this will make sense right now. Okay, we're taking this structure. Why is that significant? Oh, I'm gonna prove it to you. Okay, and we're gonna do this. I love the questions. It means you guys wanna know it and understand it. So I appreciate it. OAC2, 
THF and water. Step two, NaBH4. Okay, both are going to form alcohols, but this is the situation where it matters. Okay, so before it didn't matter, now it does. Okay, so in your head, let's go through this line. Okay, let's go to the acid catalyzed hydration conditions. Okay, so clearly we're going to have a choice between the primary or the secondary position. We're going to choose the secondary position because of Makovnikov's rule. So I'm going to isolate this intermediate. Do I see a rearrangement possible? Yes, you guys should all be saying yes. So that would be this hydride moving over one position to form the tertiary carbocation. Then, you know, water just comes in and attacks. So you synthesize an alcohol on that tertiary position. This would be the only product I need to draw on the test because that center is a chiral. All right, let's do the exact same thing following this reaction scheme up to my left, okay? So we know we're gonna form this cyclic mercuric acetate bridge. So let me draw that over here. This is the main intermediate. And let me just, you know, there's also the other version of this. So the other enantiomer, um, positive. This is, this is the difference between the intermediate line. So let me just maybe box this and call this the intermediate line. And we knew that THF didn't do anything, but we knew that water was going to come in and attack at the more substituted position. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, I'm just gonna show water attacking here and breaking that bridge. So, you know, quickly, we saw that HGOAC would swivel over. Um, we saw that water would come in, okay? And I, I did the subsequent, you know, deprotonation stuff already, but we're all intents and purposes there for step one. And then step two, what it's gonna do is it's gonna remove that hydride, okay? so. I mean, that mercury group, that's the demercuration part. So you can just put a proton, okay? Or erase it, because it's CH3. So now, and we also get, this is racine, right? Don't forget there was the other major enhancement. But now these are my products, okay? Products. So before, you saw that we got the exact same things, okay? So here, oops, excuse me. For here, it didn't matter because we all, there were no rearrangements possible anyway, so this didn't show any difference in terms, of, in terms of products. We got the same secondary, you know, reagent going on here. However, in this situation where we clearly had a carbocation rearrangement, that we had vastly different products in terms of structural isomers um, because of the intermediates that we go through, okay? So that's like the biggest takeaway from this reaction. It's like you can form pretty much the same thing most of the time with acid catalyzed hydration, However, this is a situation where like, let's say Dr. Peterson gave you this on the test and she was like, I want you to show me the reagent conditions that form an alcohol on, you know, the secondary position only. Okay. You couldn't say to that question that because you would form them on the tertiary because of a rearrangement. So the correct answer would have to be the oxymercuration conditions. Yada, yada, yada. Okay. So everybody follow that logic. I know that was kind of a long explanation, but I hope that kind of makes some sense. Okay, let me check the chat box for some questions. <sighs> I'm out of breath. Let's see. I'm kind of confused on the conclusion when you get an ether and alcohol. I mean, Anik, I hope that you kind of understand that a little bit more. There's no ether here ever. Um, for this example, could you have a methyl on a wedge and the hydroxyl on a dash, or does the hydrogen need to be on a dash with the methyl on the wedge? Hey, Brian, one more time, I'm going to read that. For this example, could you have the methyl on a wedge? Um, the question for the last, oh God, where was that? Um, here, we're talking here. Um, could we have a methyl on a wedge, hydroxyl on a dash? Um, let me think. Methyl on a wedge and hydroxyl on a dash. Um, sure, that works. Yeah, you can do that. I like that. That works, Brian. And Abby, I hope that makes more sense. Does everybody should be asking the question Abby's asking? Why is this significant? Do you guys all follow that? This is why it's significant. One rearranges, one can't. Okay. Hope we're good. Let's keep moving. We got so much to cover. So that's one reaction condition. Let's do a couple of examples. Just break the products really quickly. Okay, so we are now on page 66. We are going to do 11, um, uh, let's just do 11Z, okay, real quick. So 11Z on page 66, we have, you know, this structure with, looks like a terpetal group. And we're subjecting it to the condition that we've seen already. Um, 
Um, darn, I really just thought about, I really want to move up with, to Orgo 2 with you guys. I'm like really sad about it because it's like, I'm, I'm going to be a spring senior and like, I really want to finish with Orgo 2. Like I haven't thought that in a while. And you guys are a good group, good, good, good group of students. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll reach out to Brenner. Let's see. Potentially, I'll reach out to Brenner, just saying. And, but I don't want to switch sides because I love Dr. Peterson. I don't know, I'm conflicted. We'll see. Okay, so essentially, uh, <laughs> you guys are funny. So essentially, we're going to take this same reagent, and we know we're forming alcohols for all intents and purposes on the more substituted position, okay? So we're forming an alcohol on the more substituted position. However, there are no rearrangements possible. Okay, so that's all you really need to know. So essentially, out of the secondary or the tertiary position, which one's more substituted? Clearly the tertiary. So you can just basically go right to the products where an alcohol forms at the tertiary position. So you get two main geometric isomers here. So you get this one. And you also get, and this is how fast you guys should be on the test. You don't have enough time to like draw the mechanism out for everything. So that's why I'm saying like, you guys should know, okay, this is going to do the same exact thing as acid chylase hydration conditions. However, I know I'm not going to rearrange at all. But luckily, this is a situation where we didn't have to rearrange anyway, because we already had a secondary or a tertiary. So it didn't matter. Okay. So I hope everybody got there. And again, if I were to do this exact same reaction line with that, you would also get the exact same products. So the exact same things. This is a situation where they would form the same thing. So 11, oh no, now I think we're on 11 AA. Oh my God, there's so many problems. Okay, so this should be ringing bells off in your head. Okay, and again, same, same reaction conditions. You know, I'm not gonna write them all out. You guys can understand what I'm saying. So this should be, you know, ringing bells in your head. And the reason that is, is you would think ring expansion, great Emily, you would think that. However, this is not a situation with ring expansions because we're not going through what? Through what? What are we not going through? C plus, carbocation rearrangements. We're not doing that. So even though this is a huge trick on your test, and that's why I wanted to talk about this and emphasize why this matters, you are not going to rearrange actually here. So for all intents and purposes, I will draw your mech, I will draw like a certain steps of your mechanism just so you guys can understand. But what's really happening is you get your bridge here. Oops, I'm sorry, that goes there. Okay, and remember water is gonna just come in and attack here and break that bridge, okay? So you're left with a structure that looks like you have water here, okay? And you know that last step is just this water, I mean this hydride moving that whole thing away. So you're left with a structure that looks like this and it never once rearranged, okay? So that's kind of like the key thing here is like, you still follow Markovnikov's rule in the sense that water adds regioselectively onto the more substituted side. However, there was no carbocations ever, so there is no ring expansion. And that's a very, very common trick on this exam, okay? It's a trick. It's not like, it's not like a mean trick. Like, obviously, like, you would know that if you, if you understood this reaction. So when I say we trick you, we trick you because it's important objectives, not, like, meanly, if that makes sense. Okay, let me see the chat box if you got anything going on. Wow, such trickery. Yes. Um, okay, I'm not sure it said that Syracan does not retain step two. Um, okay, so um, what, Maria, what, what Dr. Peterson or Dr. Habenet is saying is the stereochemistry with respect to the bridge of the HGOAC, this guy, is not retained because the hydrogen is just gonna come in and kick it off anyway, so it doesn't matter. And it becomes a chiral in the end product. I think that's what she's referring to. So no, you don't have to, and you're not even gonna show this in the product. Emily, when you cross out mercury, um, is that a hydrogen or a C? That's so, so this was, so yeah, actually great question. So essentially it was, so you can already see the two protons here. So all I'm doing, is I'm erasing this guy and I'm drawing an H. So it becomes a CH3 group. It's a great question. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, so that's 11 AA. Let's go on to 11 BB. Okay, so we have something that looks like this. Um, 
Okay, so again, I'm just gonna say same so you guys know what reaction conditions we're doing. Okay, so again, this is just forming an alcohol on the more substitute position. It's actually better because there's no rearrangements. So out of the tertiary or the secondary, we're expecting a tertiary carbocation. I mean, excuse me, not a tertiary carbocation, a tertiary alcohol. And we generated a chiral center. So we have to consider both main structures. And that, okay? Pretty easy, right? So I think you guys are getting the trend. And then once you guys get the trend, you guys will be so quick with this. So keys to remember for oxymercreation, I think we're good with this. No rearrangements at all. Still forms a alcohol on, on the um, Markovnikov position. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this. So for this reaction, we don't have to know the mechanism and there's not, that is not true, Lauren. Um, this reaction, you do need to know the mechanism for step one. You don't need to know the mechanism for step two. Okay, that's the sodium borohydride stuff. Okay, so you have to be able to show, so here actually, if you go to page, yeah, let me give you a good example. If you go to page, one second guys. Um, okay, if you go to page 73, and you look at 16A, okay? So you would be responsible. So this is what I'm showing you guys. You guys would have to be responsible for drawing the mechanism up until this step, okay? Notice that's why we drew that. And we're gonna talk about these as well. These are all partial mechanisms that you all need to know. But for all intents and purposes right now, you only need to know how to draw the mechanism for step one, okay? And that's proof right there. Okay, we're gonna move on because it's already somehow 12.45 and we have a lot more reactions to cover. Um, okay, so we are gonna move on to hydroboration conditions, okay? So hydroboration, so we're gonna do hydroboration. I'm telling you, the last three are relatively easy compared to these. Hydroboration, oxidation. Okay, so these names are crazy complicated, but don't worry about them. Okay, so let's take that same vinyl thing that I've kind of been subjecting everything to. And the reaction here is going to be something called borane. Okay, so BH3 is borane. And we have THF again, and we know THF is just inert, so we can ignore it. And then for step two, we have sodium hydroxide. And we also have um, hydrogen peroxide. So if you guys ever were curious to know what hydrogen peroxide is, like, you know, the stuff that you put on your chemicals, on your, on, excuse me, on your burns, the chemicals you put on your burn. That should be a dash, it should be that. Okay, this is hydrogen peroxide, if anybody cares. THF is inert, Emily, so it has, it's a solvent. All it is, it's like, you know how when you say like, for instance, like I want to put soap in a container full of water. Like this is borane in the container fold of THF. THF is used because it solvates, it, it kind of dissolves this really good, but it doesn't react with it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so borane, borane's really cool. So let's analyze that, that structure for a second. So boron, I don't know if you guys remember back to like baby chemistry and gen chem, but boron is a structure, is an atom, excuse me, that can uh, accommodate lesser than the octet electrons. It, it's okay with six valence electrons, you know, and the way that we used to remember that is boron the moron. Okay, boron the moron. So you guys know that having six valence is totally okay. So if I were to draw a perpendicular line so directly through here, and I were thinking something based on sterics, just purely sterics, is the left side or the right side more substituted? Okay, so let's call it position A or side B, side A or side B, and is which side, give me a letter, is it A or B is more substituted? or more sterically hindered? Obviously, B, yeah, you guys all see that, awesome. B, and B is the answer because we have two hydrogens, even though hydrogens are very, very tiny in terms of sterics, we have two and we have one. So what's interesting here is that boron is regioselective and it's also stereospecific. So this is a both situation. So it's regioselective and stereospecific, and I'll talk about why. Okay, so it's, first of all, regioselective because the BH2, I'm gonna call this the BH2 fragment, and I'm gonna call this the H fragment. The BH2 fragment is going to approach this alkene such that the BH2 group is on the less sterically hindered side. So for all intents and purposes, I'm gonna reproduce this below. So we have BHH over here, and we have H over here. So I kind of drew it exaggerated, but essentially 
this is, we can think of as too bulky for it to come near this side. So it makes sense that it wants to be on the farther away, less sterically hindered side, okay? Everybody kind of clear on that stuff? So essentially what's gonna happen is, is the, so remember, boron is, is only six valence, okay? And there's a reason why I said that. So what's happening is, is that this nucleophilic pi bond can attack that deficient atom, okay? There are no lone pairs on here, okay? So, you know, what's gonna happen is, is it's the bonded electrons from this boron, the hydrogen, that are gonna completely break and form a bond there, okay? Does everybody follow that? Before, it was a little bit different with the Helonium bridges. We had some lone pairs, all other extra lone pairs that could come back and kind of fix that deficiency. But that's not what we see here. We don't have, remember, boron the moron. We don't have a lot of electrons on boron to give, so we have to use the bonded electrons. Okay, something very important happens here, and I didn't really know this until I actually became a TA, so I didn't even catch it when I was in Orbital 1. But it's this. And I know I don't need to draw the stereo chem, but I'm going to draw it. So this is the products from step one. And the reason why I drew them on a dash or on a wedge is this is the first situation that I'm encountering something called syn addition. Okay. So we've seen anti addition. So anti means opposite faces. Okay. But this is the first time where we see syn addition or the same face, okay? And don't be, don't be frazzled. It should make sense why we're seeing syn addition. The reason we see syn addition is because before all of those reagents were two separate things. Like, like here, we had like mercuric acetate come in and then we had another reagent, water, come in later and attack. And that water was limited to this, um, the sterics that were you know, present in this intermediate. But now over here, like we're not having a second, you know, molecule come in to be that nucleophile. It's all one molecule. So since it's one molecule and it's so close, like we're talking matters of angstroms. Angstroms are 10 to the negative 10th of a meter. Like, you know how tiny that is? So this is so close. For, so for all intents and purposes, they're going to add, if the BH2 group is going to add on the back face, so is that hydrogen. And the BH2 group, if that's going to add on a wedge, so is that hydrogen because they're so tiny and they're so close together. Like we're not going to have the chance for something to even approach on another side. Okay. So that's why we get syn addition here. Okay. So that's it for step one. And in step two, again, we don't know the mechanism, but we should understand what, you know, sodium hydroxide is doing. And in this sense, sodium hydroxide is not going to be a base. It's going to be a nucleophile. So that hydroxide. So basically we just have hydroxide. Okay. And hydroxide, and you don't need to know this mechanism, but hydroxide is just going to kick this BH2 group off. Okay. So essentially you synthesize, it's just the hydrogen. And same thing over here, I'm going to draw this up, is you get the alcohol where that BH2 group was. Okay. So for the products of, you know, this main reaction scheme, we got something that looks like this. Oh, I'm sorry, I drew this wrong. It's at the end of this, oh, my bad. I dropped a carbon down here. So see, it was this carbon and then the BH2. So it was this carbon and then the BH2. So my bad, I dropped a carbon there. But yeah, so this was the structure. And then for all intents and purposes, I'll reproduce that up here. And you can see, what, what type of addition did I get? Did I follow Markovnikov's rule? No, I was anti-Markovnikov. I got the alcohol on the less substitute position, on the primary position. So this reaction has a couple of key points. And now I know I showed, I showed a lot of information your way, um, but let's just kind of talk about this again. This is another way, yet again, of forming alcohol. So we have three main ways. We have acid catalyzed hydration. We have oxymercuration, demercuration. And now we finally have hydroboration oxidation. So those are all three ways to get alcohols from alkenes. Okay, so that's the big picture. We have three ways to make alcohols from alkenes. Um, but the difference though, between each one of those is acid catalyzed hydration, the first one is going to follow Markovnikov's rule and is prone to rearrangements. The um, oxymercuration reaction is going to follow Markovnikov's rule, but not rearrange. And now this situation with hydroboration is gonna be anti-Markovnikov, but also no rearrangements, okay? So let's kind of make a summary chart. I think that's kind of, that's definitely worth taking the time to go through. So we have acid catalyzed, 
I'm going to call it ox D, just so you guys know, ox D Merck. And this is hydro bor, you know, just so you guys know. Okay, this is definitely an important chart. So these all form alcohols. That's the big takeaway. However, this is going to be Markovnikov's rule. Um, I'm going to put a C plus for rearrangements. This is going to be Markovnikov's rule again, but now no carbocation rearrangements. And this one is going to be anti-Markovnikov. Okay, again, no carbocation rearrangements. So let's take just for the all in purposes. Um, you know, maybe let's take um, here. Let's take this structure. Okay, so we're gonna just sure draw the products underneath this all these lines for that starting material. Okay, so under acid catalyzed hydration conditions, I would expect the alcohol here. Under oxygenation conditions, I expect the alcohol here. And I'm gonna draw a star to indicate chirality. And then under hydroboration conditions, I would expect the alcohol to form on the less sterically hindered position. Okay, so you can see I get three different structural analogs of the alcohols based on the reaction conditions I use. And that's kind of the whole point of organic chemists and what they do is like we're going to try and just find different reagents that produce different types of molecules. And that's how drugs are made, you know. Um, okay, so anybody care about any of this? Let's see, why does the VH200 less substituted? Um, because there's more space. That's fine. At least love that. Um, Lauren, that makes sense because then if we have to go backwards to form hydroxide, then we can go to the location of another term that can be used. Exactly. So everybody listen to Lauren. Okay. She's so important. So, so, so important. You are going to get backwards questions a hundred percent. Like, so know this inside and out because Dr. Peterson might say like, you know, uh, like this is, you know, our end product and I'm using hydroboration conditions. So where do I put the out? Where do I put the pie bond? you know, or here's my end product and I'm using acid catalyzed hydration conditions, you know, how can I draw that alkene or something like that? So 100%, um, Lauren, that was great. Yeah. Emily, I hope that helped. Awesome. Um, Lauren, why don't we don't, <laughs> I love that. Um, Emily, so we just need to replace the beach with, oh wait, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we're good. Those are like probably the two hardest reactions in this chapter. Let's keep like breezing through these things. Um, let's just do a couple examples of hydroboration. We'll move on. I know I'm doing this on speed, but I'm hoping that you guys aren't first like learning this for the first time. Okay, so I'm going to just jump to um, page 67. This is 11 um, GG. Okay, so I have, um, this is interesting. Anybody uh, know polystyrene? So if anybody, you know, if you're in a Greek house or you guys, you know, have your to-go plates or things like that, um, you know, at least my fraternity, we always get like these like, uh, like styrofoam takeaway things. And that's made out of polystyrene. And this is the, this is the monomer. This is styrene, if you guys care. Um, so that's the plastic that you guys are eating out of, if you guys care. And, but that's not polystyrene. That's a different type of molecule. Okay, so we're going to subject this thing to hydroboration conditions. So BH3, so that's borane, tetrahydrofuran. Okay, the second thing is sodium hydroxide and H2O2. Remember, we don't care about the mechanism for step two. Okay, uh, but essentially, you can know that BH2 and the H are going to do syn addition. So this is worth writing out. So just because I think this is the second time we're doing this. So I'm just going to draw H and the BH2. And I know that in terms of stereochemistry, I'm not 100% accurate here with my structure. But just quickly, can you guys recognize that we get that, you know, syn addition, and we also get, you know, that one as well. Okay, so we're getting those two. And then we know hydro sodium hydroxide is a source of that alcohol. So for all intents and purposes, it's just going to be that. So you basically can just predict the product and know to go straight to the less substituted alcohol. And it's apyrol. And most of the hydroboration conditions are going to be apyrol because we're always on the less kind of primary substituted position. You know? All right. So I think that's good for 11GG. Okay. So let me do this for you guys. This is going to be a very important question. Wink, wink. So I think, um, yeah, let's do this for you guys because I really care about all of you. Um, Um, 
one sec, guys. Just trying to. I just made this up. This isn't in the workbook, but. OK. So roadmaps, OK? I, like, I think we like roadmap, roadmaps. So A, B, C, and D, what are the reagents necessary to complete the chemical transformations? So clearly, from here to there, you're adding an alcohol, but it's on the less substituted position. There's only one reaction I know that adds an alcohol in the less substituted position. So this would be the BH3 guy. Great. I'm just going to draw BH3 so you guys know what that one is. B, OK? So this one is adding an alcohol specifically onto the more substituted position. You really could say two responses. So I would honestly just say acid catalyzed here. Acid catalyzed. So that would be like HCl and water. Okay, something like that. So C, okay, this is kind of a dead giveaway. So I'm not going to draw all the, all the reaction conditions because this is clearly just the first step because I have this still here. So I'm just going to draw that step one. And then for D, you know how to add that. That's just HBr. That's the first reaction. Sometimes you guys forget like the very easy, easy ones because we're so complex now. Okay. So definitely be able to do this. All right. Let's keep moving. Let's try and finish. I'm going to definitely go. I'm definitely going over. So it's up to you guys. I won't be able to do an extra session this week because your test is Friday. So it's either like I can use Wednesday to just do like exam review and answer questions and then do an, an, like an old exam or or like carry it over. And I think it's just best to kind of like finish some of these reactions right now. I think we have to do alkynes too. Oh, oh my God, there's so much to cover. Yes, I'm going really quick. Oh no, go back really quick. I thought you said, can you go really quick? Yes, I agree. Mood. I'm trying to go as fast as I can, but it's so hard to like teach these reactions from the start. I'm trying to upload both of these on Wednesday. Um, when was the upload? I'm trying to, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. Like this, these, these two chapters are a lot. Alkynes is, okay, don't worry. But if, you, if you guys haven't gotten to alkynes, don't worry. It's really an extension of what we've already seen. So like you can really pick up all of chapter seven in my really professional opinion in a day. So like just make sure you can get through all these weird chapter six reactions first and then we'll, you'll be able to touch up on those chapter seven stuff after that. Okay, we're going to move really quickly. So the next reaction. So we're going to do something called ozonolysis. So this is one of a really, really cool reaction. You guys will probably like this a lot. There's no mechanism, so that's exciting. Okay, so let's take this molecule. We're subjecting it to ozone. And then something, you might see it as DMS, another one of my abbreviations. Or you might see it as CH3, 2, and then there's an S. So this is dimethyl sulfide. Okay, so DMS, dimethyl. So two methyl groups, you guys see that? Dimethyl sulfide. Okay, just another solvent, okay? Don't, don't worry about it. And this is ozone, like the actual ozone that's in the atmosphere. So there is no mechanism, okay? All these other ones aren't gonna really have mechanisms, so that's great. What you wanna do is you take your pen, you draw a line through that pi bond, seriously. You put a dot at the carbons of each of those pi bonds, okay? So what this reaction does is it cuts this pi bond, okay? So you're gonna get fragments. You're gonna literally cut it down the middle. And what you're going to do is you're going to draw an O basically where you cut. So do you see where I have right, what I have right now? So let's just consider side A. Okay, so on side A, I have what looks like that. Okay, you kind of see that? So this is me cutting it. So where I cut, I put an O. That's it. Okay, so you know what's here. This was a hydrogen before. So, okay, same thing over here. So what I had before was kind of that on the right side. And then I'm going to draw an O where I cut. So that was right here. And that means I had two hydrogens before. Okay, so you actually get these two products. You get, this is formaldehyde, so this is what's used to preserve any sort of, um, like, you know, frogs, pigs, things like that for dissection. And this is acetylaldehyde, okay? Acetylaldehyde. Oops, not that, sorry. Acetylaldehyde. So you get these two products, okay? No mechanism, that's it. It's like Fruit Ninja. Yeah, love that. Cut right through it. You put an O here, an O there, and just don't forget those protons, those protons. So you basically synthesize aldehydes and ketones, you know, from these alkenes, okay? Nothing else to think of. So now we're going to go to 11, um, let's do JJ, okay? Um, JJ is like the bar. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, okay, so we're here, and we're going to subject them to ozonolysis conditions, so DMS. Okay, so again, cut, 
Okay, so really easy. Draw everything else the same. So I think this is so easy, like really. So I cut here. So that means I just put double bonded up. Done. Don't even have to rotate. You can leave it like that. And then the next one, let's draw the other fragment. So the fragment on this side was, okay, so I cut there. So done. Literally, so easy. No mechanism, no key intermediate points. This is like one of your easiest reactions, okay? Just cut where that pi bond is. It's not gonna cut these pi bonds. It doesn't touch carbonyls. It only touches carbon-carbon, the double bonds. Okay, it's 11 JJ. Let's do this example because people kind of don't really like this. So um, the rings. So this is actually a situation where we can open up rings. So what we have is, you know, um, that, okay? So I'm gonna actually number the situation because it's important. So one, two, remember always go clockwise or counterclockwise, just be consistent. So we have eight carbons, right? So I'm gonna cut, okay? So I'm gonna draw an eight carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? This is my eight carbon, okay? So what you can draw is, let me just actually number this. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the reason why I knew that this is, so you can do this one of two ways. So you can actually, sometimes Dr. Peterson draws it like this. Um, do you guys see what I did? So she kind of leaves it sometimes in this, unless this is from the top one. So she will just cut it and then put the two carbonyls right there, okay? And leave it in that confirmation. I think it's best to just do it linearly and then number because we knew on carbon one, you had a carbonyl group. You knew on two, I cut there. Okay, so two is where I cut. So that means that I should now have a carbonyl there, okay? Three, already had one, okay? Four, nothing, five, nothing, six, nothing, seven, I cut there. So seven should also have a carbonyl and eight. So this is like the open chain format. And I like that the best. Okay, that makes sense. So you can leave it like that or you can leave it like that, but this could definitely be an answer choice. So like, make sure you guys know how to like extend that. And it's so easy by just numbering. Um, and Lauren, what do you say? Uh, yes, um, but an answer choice might be another one. Exactly, an answer choice could be either one. Dr. Peterson typically likes these. Um, Habit, I think, likes these. I think I've seen, but like, it doesn't really matter. They're like really the same thing. Okay, just one's rotated nicer. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I think we spent enough time on this one, so let's move on to the next reaction. So really easy ozonolysis. Just cut and put your carbonyls there. Okay, we're on reaction nine. We have two more left, I promise. We're almost there. And this one also, very limited mechanism. Okay, so this is going to be Syn diol synthesis. As the name implies, this is going to be syn addition, okay? So syn addition is going to be, you know, the same face again. So what do we have? So let me take this, you know, same vinyl. My, all my pens are dying. Um, because I write so much with you guys. So we have this, and we're subjecting it to this thing, osmium tetroxide. So osmium is one of those um, um, heavy earth metals, um, H2O and H2O2. Okay, so what we have here is we have osmium tetroxide, water, and we have hydrogen peroxide. And we'll go through the purpose of all of those in a second. So the Lewis structure, this is another situation. Like I said, you need to know the structure for nitro groups, like which was, you know, the Lewis structure was that, that was important. You also need to know the Lewis structure for osmium tetroxide. So osmium tetroxide is this, you know, center um, coordinate metal in the middle, osmium, and you have four carbonyls. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. So we have this, that, okay. So we're here. Um, one sec. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, thanks, Lauren. Honestly, these um, office, for me, like, this is just, I'm not even looking at anything. This is just coming from my brain. It's like second nature to me. So I, um, yeah, no, I, like, I really like helping you guys out. Like, I'm not even getting credit this semester. I'm really just doing this for fun for you guys. Um, yeah. Also, yeah, my boyfriend has a lot of um, friends in this class. So I was like, I'm going to TA it while all his friends are in it, at Ryan, at Emily, at Hal. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so essentially we have this nucleophilic pi bond. 
And this is going to be another concerted mechanism. So that pi bond is basically going to just follow this. So this pi bond is going, and this is weird. I honestly never understood why the electrons moved in this fashion, but we're just going to accept it. You know, this is the one thing where I'll just say, just accept it. So this pi bond is going to grab that oxygen, right? Okay. And then that carbonyl with those, with those pi bonds in there is going, one of those pi electrons is going to rotate to this osmium. Don't ask. I really don't know. And then what happens is because I'm pushing these, well, actually I can do a little bit of logic here. So this pi bond hitting here exceeds the octet. So it forces one of these bonds to break. And then you just, since it's a, since it's one of these rare earth metals, it has all these D orbitals that you can you know, throw extra electrons into. So then this, this pi bond will break, okay, and put lone pairs onto that osmium. And then this now exceeds the octet here. So then this swivels out and then grabs the other end of the pi bond. Okay, really weird. Okay, and I don't really have the best logic for you. But this pi bond is going to form a bond to the oxygen here, single bond. This bond breaks, you get lone pairs on the osmium. And then that forces one of these bonds to come out and form a bond to the other carbon of the pi bond. Okay, so essentially, the resulting structure is going to be something that looks like this. Okay, and I'm going to draw, you know, just um, to be accurate, let me just do it like this. Yeah. Okay, so we have that intermediate. And then you could have also said that it approached on the back face. And again, you know, I'm just trying to be accurate with my stereochemistry. I'll try to be better with you guys. And there. Okay, that is all you need to know in terms of mechanism. This is it, okay? So what does water do? Well, have you guys heard of hydrolysis before? Hydrolysis is just a word that means to cut with water, like, like almost like fracking, but like it's just using water to cut things, okay? So all intents and purposes, your water, yeah, you guys know hydrolysis, there you go. So what happens is, is water is just going to cut down this line, cut, okay? That's it. And it's going to give the protons from water is going to put OH. Okay, so essentially you get OH, OH here, OH, OH. Okay, so you get these two enantiomers, and it's interesting. And it, it we didn't really have any stereochemistry here, but you wouldn't because you didn't see it. But you could imagine that since again the same argument that we just talked about. This is one molecule. It's not two. It's one molecule. So like. Whatever is gonna add, you know, in terms of stereochemistry, like a wedge here, is also gonna add a wedge here. So, you know, if there was some sort of chirality thing to deal with here, it would both be wedges, it would both be dashes, you would both get wedges here and both get dashes here. So that's why it's called sin diol. Sin meaning the same phase, diol meaning two di alcohols, diol, two alcohols. Okay, so the last thing that you wanna do is you are going to, well, what does hydrogen peroxide do? And, for all intents and purposes, you're, you're ending after hydrolysis with this. And this does not matter whatsoever, but this is a byproduct after you cut with water. So what hydrogen peroxide does is it's going to oxidize these, you know, you can subtract just if you guys care. Hydrogen peroxide is going to hydrolyze this back to the main starting region. Okay, but that doesn't matter. You don't really need to know that. So that's the, really the purpose of hydrogen peroxide. It's not going to do anything for your main product. It's not going to really, you know, react in any sort of way. So all you need to really know is this concerted mechanism and the fact that we form syn, you know, diols, okay, two alcohols. All right, so let's do an example of that. So let's do 11 OO. Okay, so we have, I swear we're almost done. We have one more reaction after this, guys. Okay, so we have osmium tetroxide, we have H2O2, and we have water. So syndiol, really easy. So two alcohols on the same face of that pi bond. Okay, okay. Is this correct? If I did this on the test, would I get full points? And I'm sure you guys can understand what, based on the way I'm saying it. No, why? What's the word? It's a soup. There you go, miso. It's miso, we have a plane of symmetry. So if I were to pancake flip that one over, it's the exact same thing. So we would only draw one of these, okay? And write miso. Great guys, you guys are awesome. Okay, so 11, let's do one more, 11 PP. So we have, okay, eh, it's pretty similar. So here we're gonna get two diastereomers because we have that ethyl kind of already locked on that, um, you know, um, ring. So same conditions, I'm just gonna draw that, you know, double, double dagger. Uh, for that, and essentially you can imagine that we would just get here, here, 
that one. And you would also get, you know, this is still a wedge, but you would get dash, dash. And only these. You're not going to get wedge, dash, dash, wedge. You're not going to get any of those. This is stereo specific. So you only get these two diastereomers. All right. Finally, the last question. Okay, so I hope that's enough for those two. So again, ozonolysis is really easy. So you just cut those pi bonds and you put those carbonyls. Osmium tetroxide, again, really easy. Partial mechanism, you only need to know that you're putting two alcohols on the same base. And finally, we're at the last reaction, just catalytic reduction. So you made it to reaction 10. Thank you. Thank God. <laughs> so catalytic reduction, really easy, honestly. And this is going to be a favorite going all the way through out your time in order to so h2 and we're going to have an, a metal catalyst so we have you heard that sigh right i know i'm, I'm so <laughs> uh, so basically we have three different types of catalysts you could use you could and it's one or the other you don't have to use all three so platinum or palladium or nickel okay and again we don't need to know the mechanism for this we don't know the mechanism for this but essentially what it does is it converts alkenes into Alkanes, really easy. Now, you wouldn't think that this is happening like in a, in a stereo specific way, but it is. So this is something you also wanna write down in your notes. This is syn addition as well, okay? And it's syn addition because again, we have one little molecule, one little hydrogen, and if it's diatomic, let's just, and you don't need to know the mechanism, but let's just say that if this hydrogen were to add here, this hydrogen is definitely gonna add here on the same exact space, okay? So this is definitely syn addition, okay? So, you know, we can see right now we already have these protons present. So yeah, I'm gonna add in this final structure, we have, and I'll circle this for you. In the final structure, we added this extra one and we added this extra one. So we went from one at this position to two, and we went from two to three. So you can see how H2 was added across that pi bond to you know, reduce that saturation. Now, I'm gonna probably tell you like something that I, I, I don't know if it's on the test, but I think has a very good probability of it look up unsaturated fatty acid hydrogenation, okay? So unsaturated, I think this could be a good application question, unsaturated fatty acid hydrogenation, okay? Because you guys can imagine, you guys know what unsaturated fatty acids look like, hopefully, you know, back to maybe gen chem, like, or, or biochem, I don't know what you guys are in, but, you know, let's just say, this is totally worth going into for a second. I know you guys probably think I'm wasting time, but I'm not. Do, 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 do. Okay, so you could have unsaturation points. This is a triglyceride, okay? This is a triglyceride. You could have all these unsaturation points in here, okay? Have you ever like heard of like saturated fats or bad fats? So saturated fats is just this, and what they do is they basically add hydrogen under like high heat, you know, they do other processes, you know, because it's food, but they hydrogenate and they basically reduce all of these unsaturation points to a saturated fatty acid, okay? So then it literally just becomes this, you know, um, I, I'm just drawing this really quick. I know this isn't the best structure, but you don't get any more pi bonds left, okay? So essentially, this is a very bad fat. It's not healthy. This is unhealthy for you, but um, this is one way of doing that. So you can clearly see some sort of application here. Um, just look that up. Maybe you guys can, you know, get yourself a little bit of competitive edge over other people. Okay, so let's just do some examples of that. And I think I saw some questions in the chat box. Um, this is where food science comes in handy. Yeah, so you guys understand that. If you guys want to add anything about, you know, hydrogenation, I mean, if you know any chemistry about that, definitely share it with all of us. Um, but cool, animal nutrition, cool. You guys are awesome. Um, cool majors. Anyway, um, let's go on to 11, um, uh, let's do TT. Okay, 11 TT. It was such weird weird things. Okay, so we have pi bond, pi bond, pi bond. Okay, and the best part about this reaction is it's not just going to be one pi bond. You don't need to do like multiple rounds of this. It's going to so strong that it's going to reduce all of these. So this is a situation where we chose to use nickel. So you can just imagine, done. So easy. Okay, so it got, it was like, I guess if we were to plot chapter six in terms of time, you can tell I'm a scientist, right? If we plot chapter six in terms of time and we plot rigor on the y-axis, I would say, so I hope you guys agree. Okay, I think it got hard in the middle and now it's back to easy. Um, 11 WW, yes, okay. So 11 WW, that's a great, actually, I think, thank you for bringing that up because that's kind of 
one of the main reasons why I brought up the stereochemistry stuff. Okay, so before it's been pretty easy, but there's one more caveat that I think you guys should, should kind of look into. So again, this is syn addition, even though it doesn't look like syn addition. So this is gonna be a situation where the stereochemistry of your products matters. So if you're thinking that this is your only product, you're wrong, okay? This is not right just for the test. This is not right. So basically we said it was syn addition. So you can imagine if the hydrogen is gonna add on a dash, let's just say, and the hydrogen is gonna add on a dash here, you get one product that forces both of those methyl groups onto a wedge. So we get wedge, wedge, all right? So we get that structure. But you could have equally likely said that what happens if you know those hydrogens came on the wedge? That would force those existing methyl groups onto a dash. So you also get that and that. So those are your, I mean, can I see through rotations? Yeah, it looks like those are to the two products. Yeah, so you get those two main products, okay? So that's a result of the sin addition. So when it's just plain like this, anything like linear like that, and there's no branching, meaning there's no, no methyls, no ethyls, nothing coming off of that, you could basically not even think about the fact that it's syn addition, okay? Because your product is just do, 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 do. But when you have branching, when you have substituents on it, the syn addition is going to cause, you know, let me say that's ethyl. It's gonna cause, you know, these groups to be puckered out of the plane. Okay, so it's like that. And that, my friends, is the end of chapter six. Um, I need a breath. <laughs> Okay, real quick, let me just see these chat boxes. What's going on in here? Um, can you move up to two too quickly? Yeah, TT's up there. Um, and will we be doing number 10 next time? I don't think we ever ended up going over it. What's number 10? Question 10? Yes. Um, okay, now we're really over time. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Let me think for a second. I'm nervous we're not gonna get enough time on Wednesday. Okay, this is what you guys need to do for homework or like in quotes homework. Okay, you need to make sure you guys understand everything in the chapter six um, workbook and in terms of the chapter six section, um, understand all of those reactions coming into Wednesday, okay? Definitely expose yourself to chapter seven stuff, meaning like the alkyne stuff, look at the notes, go over the videos and stuff like that. And we're gonna go through everything in chapter seven on Wednesday. It might go over an hour, it probably will, but like we will definitely do all of chapter seven on Wednesday. And I think your test is when? Friday, right? Is it Friday? Someone? Yeah? Okay, potentially, potentially Thursday, I might throw in a bonus thing and we can just do like an exam review or like do an old, like, you know, an old exam, okay? Potentially, potentially, okay? So um, definitely make sure you know everything of chapter six going into Wednesday, okay? Because I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Okay, email me with questions, post them on Piazza. Sometimes I'm sneaking on there and I can like respond to you guys. Um, chapter seven, we'll do all on Wednesday and we'll try and finish the exam stuff or maybe do an exam review on Thursday. All right, um, have a great rest of your day, guys. You guys got this, keep going. I'll see you guys soon.